Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to go through the lab for chapter 13, uh, multiple testing. Uh, and we're going to focus on um, two main criterion for multiple testing, family-wise error rate and false discovery rate, um, as well as how to estimate things like false discovery rate. Okay, so as usual, we have our, um, our standard inputs. These are all familiar by now. And then we have a few new ones. Most of the new ones are these t-test functions from the SciPy stats package. And they're just going to be used to, um, to we're going to do a lot of comparisons so that the t-test is a, is a simple comparison. So there's a one sample t-test, uh, an in, a, two, a two sample independent t-test, and then a paired t-test. So ind stands for independent, rel stands for related. And then we'll do, we use this um, multi underscore te or multiple test function from Sci from the stats models package to compute these adjusted p-values. Um, OK, so we're first going to uh, do some basic hypothesis tests using these t-test functions. So we're going to start off by um, making some data. Uh, and we'll what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the, the one sample test. We're going to have 100 instances of 10 draws of normal data. The first 50 columns are going to have um, mean 0.5, and the last 50 are going to have mean 0. So we have 50% uh, that are you know, really true signal, non-zero signals and 50% uh, nulls. OK. And so the way we, you know, we're going we're to compute the t, t statistic testing whether the, um, you know, the mean in the first column of the data is 0 or not. And this result here has an attribute called p-value. Here, the p-value is 93%. So that's actually very far from the usual threshold of 5%. So there's not a lot of evidence that uh, the mean isn't 0 in this column. And that may be a little bit surprising because, well, we had a, a mean of a half uh, for each of the entries here. But I guess this means that we just don't have a strong signal. OK, so we could compute now 100 p-values here. And this is where the topic of multiple comparisons come in. We can compute 100 because we have 100 different columns in the, in the data set. OK, so let's compute all our p-values. So we're going to run a for loop, and we're going to store all the 100 p-values in our for loop. Um, and we're going to look at, you know, if we choose to threshold at 0.05, we're going to just cut the p-values at 0.05 and take a look at you know, how these 100 different p-values behaved. So we'll make a little table, a 2 by 2 table, similar to a table you can see in the textbook. Um, and we ha there's typical labels that are assigned to each cell here. So the way this table is laid out is the columns indicate whether, the, uh, in truth, the null hypothesis is true or false. So this is like the true version of the hypothesis. And this is our decision, whether we rejected or did not reject uh, H0. Okay, so once you know, for instance, this number here, five here, uh, there are five true null hypotheses that we decided to reject, and uh, so that's five out of um, hundred. So that's actually a false positive rate about um, uh, of sorry, five out of fifty. There were fifty true nulls, and we rejected five, and that's a false positive rate about ten percent. So false positive rate can be computed using this column here. Um, and in the book, we talk later about false discovery rate or false discovery proportion that's computed uh, from this row here. So this, in the, this letter is usually called V uh, for, that's the letter given in the summary. And the sum of these two things, 5 plus 15, that's usually called R. And the FDP, we'll see later, uh, is V over R. So the false discovery proportion, if we look at all the ones we decided to reject, we rejected 20, and 5 out of 20 of them were false, so about 25% false discovery proportion. So the name of the game in these multiple comparisons tasks is to sort of consider these 100 different hypotheses and make decisions, that is, choose a cut, like 5%, in such a way that, well, maybe we we limit the number of false positives we make, or we, we limit the, the false discovery proportion. That's sort of how these things go. OK. Um, so we're going to repeat the experiment, but 
with a slightly higher signal. Um, so instead of having a, a 0.5 in the first 50 columns, we're going to have a 1. And so as we increase the signal strength, we'd expect we would have uh, more discoveries, uh, because at least in the first, in the first 50 uh, rows, but um, hopefully not too many more false discoveries. So we'll, we'll recreate the table with the same cuts. Um, OK. And now we see, um, well, we only have 2 out of 48 false positives. Uh, that's good. The other flip side of a false positive is, is a false negative. And that would be a case where there really is a signal, that is, the null hypothesis is false, but we fail to reject. So here, 10 out of 50, we d the true, well, truly false nulls, that is, where there really is a signal, we did not reject. So we have a false negative right here is about 20%. Um, OK. So now, when we uh, have multiple p-values, well, we saw we're going to make some false positives, right? Here, we did 2 out of 50. Earlier, we did 5 out of 50. OK, so above, we saw that if we have um, you know, 100 different samples, we're going to get 100 different p-values. And we, we got a little feel for you know, the number of false positives one makes uh, in doing 100 tests, and a little bit for the, the false discovery proportion um, look by looking at that summary table of the 100 outcomes and a decision rule about for each of the 100 outcomes. So uh, the field of multiple comparisons, what it is sort of based on is trying to make decision rules. Uh, and each decision rule makes one of those tables, like this one above, to satisfy certain properties. And one property that people are have been interested in for some time is the family-wise error rate. And this is out of the 100 decisions we made ab above, the family-wise error rate is whatever decision rule we make, what's the chance we make any false positives? So what's the chance that uh, this number is greater than 0? And you can construct a procedure so that the chance of making a false positive is, say, less than 5%. Now, we already saw that procedure is not going to be just making the decision at level 5% for each test, because what well, we saw very easily that we make we make false discoveries when thresholding at even, 5%. Even if all the 500 hypotheses were, were the null hypotheses were true, at 5%, you'd, you expect to make about 25. You'd probably expect to declare 25 of them significant. Yeah. So we're going to have to make a, 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 thr a stricter threshold for that. And so we have a plot here for, we can compute for independent tests at least, what's the, fa the fan wise error rate as a function of that threshold, which above was 5%. And m is the number of, um, the number of tests. So here's a little plot below. Um, and we can see you know, at using the, the, what we call the nominal threshold of 5%, even at one hypothesis, there's a 5% chance. So the family wise error rate is 5%. But as we decrease the threshold, um, we're going to get uh, um, this, this family wise error rate is going to decrease. And we see for about 100 hypotheses, we need about uh, even less than 0.01. In fact, we need uh, 0.005 as our threshold. Or that would be safe in any case. Uh, because that's 5% divided by 100. So what that says is if you use a 0 0.0005 level for each of the tests, then the chance of getting any false positive is going to be controlled at 5%. Yes, yeah. yes. so the, clearly that's very strict, yeah. right? Because uh, it puts a burden, high burden on the, 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 f the, the hypothesis whose null is false or where the alternative is true because it has, they have to have small p-values in order to, to get declared significant mm -hmm. or in order to not reject their null hypotheses. Uh, but nevertheless, you can actually, uh, you know, there are methods to control the family error rate, and we're, we're going to look at some of those methods. So we're going to use one of the data sets, um, the, uh, the fund data, uh, from the package using our load data function. And I believe here there are, there are 500 managers, or we'll see, some number of managers. And that's the point. That's multiple comparisons is, is many managers. OK. Um, so first, we're going to look at, rather than looking at all of the p-values at once, we're just going to look at a small sample of, of five of them. So we'll compute, uh, the, we'll test whether each uh, fund manager is beating the market. That's whether the returns average 0 or not. Uh, and compute the, the uh, one sample t-test. And we see that sometimes the p-values are low when this first manager is doing pretty well. 
second manager is um, maybe not doing, not having a good year this year, or or didn't have a good ten years or ten quarters. What I think we had, to, however many ob observations we have. Jonathan, but we should try and get the name of that first manager. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know it, but I, I'm not. I won't share it with you. Do not going to share it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. But yes, I'll tell you later. <laughs> so the. Um, what we're going to do is, is look at some method, how we can take these original p-values and, uh, and use a method to control the family-wise error rate, in this case, at 5%. Two common methods out there are, Bonfer are called Bonferroni and Holmes method. That Bonferroni threshold, that was that 0.0005%. Effectively, the Bonferroni method, it, it just rescales each of these by the number of tests we do. So if we had 100 fund managers, um, then this p-value would be converted to 0.6 instead of 0 0.006. And that's not less than 5% anymore. So that so would be rejected. Yeah. It would be uh, not rejected. Yes. yes. Yeah, so it's quite strict. So another method is called the Holmes method, uh, which is works under similar conditions for Bonferroni, but is known to be slightly more powerful. So let's just look at those p-values for those corrected p-values uh, for those two methods. So we use this multi-test function. This is the multiple test function from the stats model package. We give it a set of p-values, and we say how to adjust the p-values. Here we'll use the Bonferroni. And uh, the, what we get out of that are decisions, like whether to reject the null hypothesis or not, as well as the adjusted p-values. So actually, this will tell us how many fund managers there are, because we'll be able to see the, the, p the correction for p-values shortly. So, oh, sorry, the, uh, we, we only applied it to five of them, so we'll, we'll know here there were five. Yeah. yeah. So we, it was 0 0.006 before, now it's 0 0.03, which is five times 0 0.006. Okay, so here um, we see actually, even with only five, um, five of the fund managers, w w this first one who looked to be doing quite well before is, is, has an adjusted p value even closer to 5%. The second, this third manager, who was the second one who seemed to be doing well, is actually sort of already gone over the threshold. So, the, okay, the next method is this, this Holmes method, um, which the smallest p-value is always, the adjusted p-value is always identical to Bonferroni, but then the subsequent ones get, get, um, get a little bit, uh, remain a little bit smaller. So at the 5% threshold, this third manager would still survive the Holmes Just threshold. Just squeaked in. Yes. Yeah, and that could make a big difference, actually, if, if bonus is based on that or something like that. And the other, these p-values, well, they're adjusted p-values were deemed to be over 1, so a p-value can't be bigger than 1, so it's just been cut off at 1. Mm. Okay, so now we see that there are some managers that seem to do well, and a few others, this second one, didn't seem to be doing well. Uh, why don't we start to look for some differences between managers? So as noted before, um, these are the two we talked about earlier. Uh, one who seems to be doing well, one who does not seem to be doing well. Um, maybe we could test the hypothesis that maybe manager one is better than manager two. So this is slightly different than the test we did before, where we were checking whether each manager beat the market by test comparing to zero. And so we need a slightly different test. For that, we use this paired t-test, this uh, t-test underscore rel for related. This means, um, for, for, and for this test, remember, as you will have read in the chapter, that the indices effectively have to be the same. For, so if these are trading days or quarters, whatever the index is, they have to be the same for each manager one and manager two. So we can compare how well manager one does in, each, in the first quarter of last year and manager two did in the first quarter of last year. And then, w again, we perform a t-test and get a p-value of about 0 0.04. So that's less than 5%. So there does seem to be evidence that manager 1 is better than manager 2. So we might want to wrap it up there and say we've, we've, we've found a better performing manager. However, well, why do we decide to, do this, to, to, to run this test? Well, of course, you know, we saw that manager 1 was the best. Manager 2 was apparently the worst. Um, so that's so there was some sort of data snooping going on. So we maybe should not trust this one too much. So with these five different managers, there are at least five. Well, there are five to two comparisons you can make, and that's ten if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so there are. If we were to 
apply the Bonferroni procedure to the 10 possible comparisons, well, this p-value would be about 0.3. So that would not be um, very strong evidence. Um, so there are some methods, uh, because you know, this problem of having different categorical variables here at which manager and a, and a common outcome, this is a kind of common, common problem or a problem of common interest. There's a few methods out there that, that sort of si take care of all simultaneous differences. So one of them is called Tukey's Highest Significance Difference. And what, rather than dwell too much on those, we'll just look at the adjusted p-values. Um, and so similar to the Bonferroni method, it produces an adjusted p-value for each of the possible hypotheses. So earlier we had five hypotheses, and we had each five different adjusted p-values. Now we have 10 hypotheses, because we have 10 comparisons. And this 0.1862, we know, well, that's not exactly the Bonferroni adjustment. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit more favorable than the Bonferroni adjustment, but it's still not less than 5%. Yeah. Um, so there's a nice summary plot of this. You can create, create with this, uh, this Tukey object. Uh, and it produces com effective confidence intervals. And I won't, they're not exactly confidence intervals, but they're intervals for each um, for each manager or each whatever the categorical variable is. And the way this plot is to be interpreted is if you see two intervals that don't happen to overlap, um, then they would have a significant, you know, a. And that pair would be significant significantly in this table yeah. we saw before. Yeah, that's yeah, a so nice compact plot. In this case, and it's actually more compact than the table because, uh, well, it's not a big difference when we have five to go from five to 10, but if we had. If you 20 had 25 managers or 50 managers, yeah, yeah that's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. 